start. Good evening, and thanks for tuning in to the COVID Cutoff Town Hall. I'm Aubrey Abbott Patterson with the Hutchinson Community Foundation. I'll be your host for tonight for what we hope will be an informative session with our local healthcare leaders. The goal is to give you an overview of the COVID-19 situation in our community and to go behind the scenes with the medical community, the people who are working on the front lines and see it every day in our community. We have a panel of local physicians and healthcare leaders here with us, each one of them offering a different perspective. They will each share for about five minutes and when they're done, I'll take the opportunity to ask some questions of the group. Through this process, we hope to answer the many questions that the physicians and health department professionals have been receiving recently. If you have a question and you're watching live, I'd ask you to put your comments in the um, comment box and we have people on standby who are ready to answer your questions directly. There are a few things that tonight is not about. This is not about a policy debate and it's not a free for all. It is truly an opportunity for us to share what we do know about a still unknown disease so that we can all make informed choices. With that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. First, we have Karen Hammersmith, Interim Health Officer at Reno County Health Department. We have Dr. Scott Pauley, Hutchinson Clinic Family Practice. Dr. Rex Degner, Hutchinson Regional Healthcare System. Amanda Hullett, Chief Nursing Officer at Hutchinson Regional. Dr. Humayun Ushroff, Hutchinson Clinic. John Miller, ICU nurse, Hutchinson Regional Healthcare System, and Dr. Ellen Lasso, Hutchinson Clinic Pediatrics. With that, panelists, if you're ready, I think we'll get this show on the road. And I'll start with Karen Hammersmith. Karen, can you tell us to begin, what are today's case counts and where can people find the most up-to-date current information that they'll need? So um, thank you for having us. We really appreciate this. Um, and we do want to get the word out. Um, today, we have a total case count of um, 816 active cases. And that is right now up on our dashboard because I have it pulled up. And we have 292 cases in our community. Um, we have over 500 cases at um, an outbreak at Hutch Correctional Facility. But that also affects what's going on in our community because we have over 500 people that work out there and they come back into our community. Um, that's not to say that they're doing anything wrong. Um, it, this is a very fast uh, moving virus, very contagious, and they're working in it day in and day out. So uh, just to let you know, that's just kind of where we're at um, with cases. We have an extraordinary dashboard here at Reno County. We have been um, blessed to have DJ Gearing, an analyst that works with us, he used to work at KDHE, um, and he has this up and running. We have more information on it than um, pretty much anywhere else in the state. So we have lots of um, people viewing it. We have uh, KSN looking at it. Cake News has made uh, reference to our dashboard, and it's available if you go to the renocounty.gov um, website, and you can get on the dashboard from there. Karen, before I let you go, could you, oh, there's a picture of that dashboard that DJ's put together. It really is impressive and something that people can look at anytime they want at renogov.org. Is that right, renogov.org? Yes, uh-huh. Karen, before I let you go, I'd ask you, could you describe for us what current health orders are in place? So we have um, a couple of health orders are in place and one is um, the, um, what is a governor's order, and that's the mask mandate over Kansas um, that she had. Um, counties could opt out of that at, at some point in time. Uh, we chose not to as Reno County. Um, and as the cases have uh, flourished here in the last couple of months, it is not something that we would want to move uh, to do. Um, it's part of the reason why we're here right now is we have so many cases in Reno County. Uh, we're in the red zone for schools. We are in the moderate zone um, for a community, which actually um, in the moderate zone, if I can describe this correctly from, from DJ, as he explained it the other day, the moderate zone actually would have um, no school in session as well. So 
Um, it is severe. By the time you get to red in a community zone, that means that you need to shut absolutely everything down. So, um, you know, those are things to think about as we're looking at our gating criteria. Um, we have that on there, so we're being very transparent. These are the cases in Reno County. Um, we are counting positive cases. These aren't things that we have come up. These are these are with the test that the their lab confirmed PCR test, and so that is with being put out here. Um, the deaths are what's going on a, a death certificate. So um, unfortunately we have has 19 deaths um, from this. So it's very, very serious. We have a lot of recoveries, which is awesome. But just looking at percentages, the higher percentage rate you have, the higher percentage rate you're gonna have of re really seriously ill patients, which is where we're at. And it's where the hospital has become overwhelmed. And it's what we're wanting to let you know. We've got um, a lot of really smart people here that are working so hard in the hospital in the clinic setting. And that's what we want to showcase is what's going on. Thank you for that. Dr. Polly, can you talk to us about why this virus is different than the flu? Yeah, it's, it's quite different. Um, it took me a while to kind of appreciate why. Um, going back to January, I'll be honest, I was completely wrong. I told many people I never thought it would make it from China to here. So um, I've quickly been educated on it, though, as others have. The, the first is there's no seasonality to this. Um, when we speak of the flu season, we know that each time shortly before, usually students go on Christmas break, we start seeing it. And uh, it's a horrible time of year for outpatient, inpatient providers. And then we know typically in the early spring, it kind of goes away. This, however, is apparently gonna be here for 12 months. Uh, it arrived in the spring, it's come through the summer, and here in the late fall, it is hitting a fever pitch. So I could imagine whatever we're experiencing now, if we don't do anything about it and the immunity is not long lasting, this will be a 365 day kind of virus, not a three month kind of virus. Additionally, this, this spreads much more easily. Uh, Karen alluded to who, how contagious it is. Um, compared to the flu, um, we do see that an infected individual is likely to infect more individuals surrounding them. There's some factors playing into that. One is the immunization. Uh, we forget that in this country and other, you know, mainly Western countries where we have large access to the influenza immunization that cuts down on the transmissibility of the virus. Even if you specifically didn't get the flu shot, you're by nature less likely to get it because those around you did get the flu shot and are therefore less likely to get it and spread it to you. One of the big things we're seeing here is the fact that we have asymptomatic spread. And I use the word asymptomatic loosely. A lot of people with COVID might just have such mild symptoms. They write it off to something else. You know, what we around here refer to as, you know, state fair allergies, meaning the August time sniffles, runny nose, that very well could have been COVID. And I was speaking to a patient today and I said, that would be like my, my coattails being on fire, but not realizing it. I'm, I'm walking through your house, through my place of business to use an agricultural reference. I'm walking through your pasture and leaving a trail of fire behind me and, and not realizing it. With the flu, we don't see that. Most people, by the time they have muscle aches and fever, they're not going to work. Uh, and they're real, they really weren't shedding much of any virus prior to that point. And then even for those who get really sick with COVID, uh, the studies consistently have shown for the 48 hours prior to symptom onset, they're already spreading it. Um, next, you know, I, I referenced the immunization, but we just don't have it for COVID, at least not yet. My hope is we can slow play this process until we do. Um, that'll be the real game changer as well as new therapeutics. Um, the flu has, the flu meaning influenza has some therapies, they're not perfect, but they're better on an outpatient basis than none. Um, Lastly is what we're looking at and we're staring down the barrel of. This has killed 19 people in our community. In none of our lifetimes has influenza killed 19 people in a single year in this community. I'd have to look at the numbers. I mean, I, we'd have to go back and add up many, 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 many years, maybe even a decade or more to even get to 19 influenza deaths. Um, in the month of October, we've had 49 patients in the hospital, not with COVID, but because of COVID. If in a given month, influenza put 49 patients in our hospital, we would be making national news and 
we would be the start of the new influenza pandemic that would spread across the globe. To not bat, bat an eye at that with COVID is really strange to me because we would be known in the history books as the start of the influenza pandemic of 2020 if we had 49 flu patients in our hospital this month. Um, the next is something we haven't quite seen a lot of, but we will is um, the post COVID sequela, meaning problems that we're now seeing in this country with people who have already recovered. Influenza, for those who recover, we don't see a lot of lingering symptoms, whether they're respiratory or neurologic or other things, but with COVID, we are. Um, when, when your positive test rate is low and you don't have a lot of cases, you will by definition see fewer of those things. But we're at the point now and so many people are getting infected so rapidly, uh, those things that would otherwise be rare are likely gonna become more common to us. So long answer, but it's, it's vastly different. That was a really good answer and I appreciate that. Thank you. Dr. Degner, I'd like to turn to you now and ask you, um, can you talk to us about the, the capacity of our hospital and what the capacity is to handle COVID patients and when our hospital is capacity is high, um, what are the impacts on other medical issues um, for the people who live here? And can you hear me? My internet connection is going in and out. And I caught part of that question, but I'll answer what I think you were asking, which is fine. <laughs> and can. I do want to clear up, clear up some rumors and information that's been floating around the community about the capacity of our hospital. I mean, we're licensed for 190 beds. We have 22 ICU rooms and, you know, that's bed capacity, astrophysical capacity. We never run at that level. At the beginning of the pandemic with Amanda Holt's great work and others in the hospital, we worked up a contingency plan where how many COVID patients did we think we could take? And that's back when we had access to many more nurses in the community, many more resources that we thought at one point we could fill up 22. We could have overflow rooms with extra ventilators put in those rooms. We could handle maybe 60 COVID patients at any one time. That was a hope back then. Reality has set in. We have an ICU that has rooms that we can't staff completely with nurses. The COVID patients that we have in right now are high intensity patients, take a lot of nursing time, take a lot of physician time. We are reaching capacity with the amount of COVID patients that we can handle at this very moment. Over the weekend, we had up to 29 COVID patients in the hospital. Today, at, at, as of 3.30, we had 24 positive COVID patients in the hospital, nine of which were in the ICU, five of which were on the ventilator. going on and in order to take care of the community we can only handle so many COVID patients as we get more COVID we are getting to the point where as of next week we're going to be limiting certain elective procedures so that we can free up nursing and other personnel to take care of the COVID patients we're really we really are reaching critical mass we can't handle 60 COVID patients in this hospital, or if we did, that would be all we would have in the hospital and everything else would have to be diverted to other communities. And that may not be just Wichita, that may be diversion to Kansas City, to Omaha, to somewhere else that could take them. And that's for your routine care. Dr. Degner? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we, we did lose you for a little bit. We may. Okay. We may have missed some critical information there. I wondered if you could go back and talk to us about the numbers of people in the ICU and, and in particular, maybe those who are on ventilators. Correct. We have 24 total COVID patients in-house as of this afternoon. Nine of those are in the intensive care unit and five of those are on the ventilator. Okay, thank you. I, I'm sorry that we lost you for a bit. 
No, that's oh. fine. My connection is coming and going. Sorry. Um, can you talk to us about who is coming into the hospital? Where are they coming from? Are they all from our community or are they from other communities? Are they from nursing homes or the prison only? And I'm gonna defer some of this to Amanda, but the, predominantly they are from our community and that's what we're taking care of. Of course, the prison is in our community. We don't, they're not, the prisoners are not. And we do have some of the prisoners coming over as capacity allows. We're working very closely with the Department of Corrections that they don't over, overwhelm our local system with contingency plans that those inmates be transferred up towards Lansing and the KU system are transferred elsewhere. Um, so we're taking the inmates on an as needed basis. Luckily, most of the prisoners that have it at this point are being able to take care of in the prison itself. Um, but we do have you know, a number that, that do make it over. We do accept some COVID patients from the outlying communities, the smaller hospitals out West that have no capacity for that. And we have been taking some of those as we've been able to. Um, our problem is that once we reach capacity, the Wichita hospitals are also reaching a similar capacity. And it is very difficult for us to transfer out a COVID patient to another facility to the point that we may have to transfer out some of our regular non-COVID patients to other hospitals so that we can maintain what we have. So in order to continue to serve all the healthcare needs of this community, you know, we need to do all that we can to help tap the brakes a little bit and mitigate things as we try and catch up to the caseload. Thank you. Amanda Hullett, um, I'd like to ask you if you would um, have anything to add to Dr. Degner's response there as he suggested, but also as the chief of nursing, I wonder how's the hospital staff holding up? What's their capacity? Um, what, are you, what challenges are they facing? So um, to kind of tag on to what Dr. Degner is saying, we do have a lot of COVID patients. There's really three predominant large areas that we keep those. One, the ED, um, where they come in, where they're initially um, evaluated to see if they need admission, um, or in some cases they can be sent home and uh, monitored from a home setting if they're not significantly ill enough to be in the hospital. Um, but in inpatient setting, we have two. And I, I do want to clarify, we have an 18 bed um, ICU and we have a unit that is our medical COVID unit. Um, it was well described as sort of a mini ICU. And um, I thought that, that was a great description because really that's how it's functioning right now. Um, there's 13 beds in that unit, but it was designed to be a dual capacity. Um, and so there, there are two, two beds per room, but having 26 patients in there is, is not realistic. Um, we have to take into account gender. We have to take into account other infectious processes before you can double patients up. And so um, we, we look at that as a case by case and work with our physicians and collaborate on ways to put multiple patients um, in rooms if, if we have a need. And we have had to do that um, in several different cases. Um, but when you look at what it takes to staff and to take care of a COVID patient, it's different than a regular patient. These patients require a different set of protective equipment for nurses to wear, for physicians to wear as they go in and out of rooms. And a nurse could go into a room and a patient could need a pain medication, need something different, and they could go out and get it and come back in. But with COVID, that's not how it works. Once you go into that room, you're in that room. You have everything on that you need to be in there. And so it takes additional runners and taskers and people to bring you additional supplies and bring you additional um, treatment things that are needed. And a nurse could easily be in a room for an hour uh, plus just taking care um, of one patient, let alone the multiple that, that we have. And that's what is different um, from taking care of a COVID patient versus a regular patient. And it's different in, in how much care they require. We have ventilators, we have BiPAPs, we have AirVos, we have high flow oxygen, and all of those are different treatments depending at the level um, that a patient needs. And you know, in the, over the course of the last couple of weeks, we've had days where on our, on our COVID medical unit, we'll need to transfer two patients to the ICU and trade two patients out from the ICU up to that COVID floor. And just shuffling beds like that um, is, is tricky. But in addition to those COVID patients, 
you're still going to get your acute MIs. You're still going to have stroke patients. You're still going to have traumas. You're still going to have chest pain patients that come in that are still going to need to be cared for. Um, and so we have an entire uh, hospital of medical units that don't take COVID that we don't um, we try to keep the COVID to, to certain areas, but there's still patients that require that nursing. Babies are still being born. Um, and so we, we have a variety of skill set and talented people. It has is, it is forced us to think outside the box and approach things from a different perspective. So we've tapped into our therapy department um, in helping us with turn teams and, and moving and transferring patients. We've utilized our pharmacists at a different capacity than what we have in the past. We have people from multiple departments stepping up to step in and help. We've been able to use nurses from other areas um, to step in and help, but, but they're not all interchangeable. And that's the wonderful thing about nursing is you have a different skill set for different areas and you have different training, different education and different things that you learn. Um, but we have an incredible group of people willing to step in and to help and to learn uh, and to adapt. But they're right. There's, there's a finite amount of patients that we can take care of with the staff that we have. And if you've been paying attention to other news broadcasts or what's going on in, in other counties, you've seen, um, you've seen that they're looking for contract nurses, um, but there's not just us, there's not just Wichita hospitals, there's all over the country trying to pick from the same pool of contract nurses. And so you get who you can um, if you're lucky enough to get those, but that's not just a ready pool that you can pull from. Um, like Dr. Degner said, you know, early on, we had pools from clinics that were shutting down um, or seeing less patients, but they're up and seeing multiple patients every day, evaluating them. Those, those nursing and clinical staff are not available like they were. And even getting help from the government, there's, there's different national guards and different staff that they're already deployed. They're in different areas working. And so getting those to come in and help support you, it just isn't there. So the pool that you have is the pool that you have. And they work so hard every single day taking care of patients that are so critically ill that they do, they pass away, they don't get better. And they're putting their hearts and their souls into taking care of these people. And then they're watching them pass along. And that has an entirely different mental and emotional um, impact that you don't get on the day to day. And so in, in addition to the physical that it takes to take care of this high acuity, you have so many other things compounding. And that's what, um, that's what makes this such a uniquely challenging time for our staff. And it does, it just, it wears on people and they get tired and they continue to show up every day and they continue to take excellent care of people. Yeah. Thank you for that. I, we got a question from somebody out in Facebook land. Um, and I think it's a really good question that so many of us are wondering, what can the community do or what community members do to support the staff um, and, and, and nurses like you're describing for what they're going through for such long periods, what can we do to help support them? I think one, being aware of what it takes every single day um, to go in, whether, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a nursing assistant, whether you're in lab or pharmacy, or you're one of our providers, each one of them is, is having a different level of weight. And so it's understanding that by wearing masks, by listening to the things that people are saying here today, social distancing and helping us with those things to keep yourself healthy, to keep us healthy is incredibly important um, in, in protecting yourselves and protecting uh, the rest of our community. And I think they always appreciate the kind words, they appreciate the understanding, they appreciate the support um, of people who appreciate what they do. And it does, it's not just the nursing staff, it's, it's all the staff that appreciate knowing that people understand how hard it is to take care of those patients and um, give that support to them. And we've seen it in, you know, people driving around the hospital and um, saying prayers, um, honk, uh, honking and, and recognizing the hard work that they do. Um, we've had people that have sent in cards and sent in encourage, encouragement to them or dropped off candy or things just to, to let them know that they're being thought about and they're being thought of. And I think those are all very valuable things. Thank you for that. I think that people you're describing are true superheroes for our community. And the best thing we can do is help to slow the spread to Absolutely. show our support for what they're doing every day. Um, Dr. Ashraf, I'd ask you um, if you could talk to us um, a little bit more about 
um, how this virus works in our bodies. Is it respiratory? Um, and what's the typical course of the disease? Um, what, can we, what can we expect from it? Hi, uh, Dr. Asher Fair. So I've been listening and I so appreciate our nursing staff, our respiratory therapist, our administration, our clinic physicians, everybody doing a great job. So uh, let's talk about like how, like the first question is how does it do like this, uh, the medical question, the medical side of things, how does this virus actually work? One thing is it's the first part of it is the whole system that gets involved. It's you get myalgias, you get weak, you get fevers, you get achy, you don't feel good, you don't wanna eat, you feel nauseated. Some people get diarrhea. All of those are what we call systemic disease. Any virus will do that. Same thing, this virus is doing that. The next part comes is specific body parts. Heart, oh, well, let's start from the top, brain. We have seen that here. We have seen heart. We have seen lungs, which we'll get back to because that's what everybody comes in with is the lung problems. We have seen diarrhea. We have seen everything that you can think of. This virus has gone from not doing anything to even a 95 year old who has had it and didn't do anything to a 50 year old who went into all organs that failed kidneys failed, lungs failed, brain failed. Uh, we never think of that way, because, but uh, literally that's how it has been. Uh, so that's it infects in different ways. It's a whole body system. And what it comes down to is leading to your next question is where, how it infects different parts of the body. The main one that, of course, I'm a pulmonologist and a critical care physician, what we worry about and what most people, 98 or 95% of the people that come into the hospital with is respiratory problem, problems breathing, their oxygen level is low, they are coughing, and that's what they all come to the hospital with. And that's where we take it into your next question is like, hey, what happens when do you come to the hospital? Mm -hmm. Well, one is dehydration. You're not able to keep up with drinking enough water. You feel bad. You're not keeping anything down. You're having diarrhea. You're vomiting. The most important one is actually breathing problems. It's the people that cannot breathe. They're coughing. They're short of breath. And that's about the 95% of the people that come to the hospital and they get admitted to the hospital is because of respiratory or lung problems. Now, starting from the lung problems, the first things that we do, talking to your next uh, question, like what do you do when you get that person that comes in that cannot breathe or they are having trouble, they're coughing, their oxygen levels are low. The main thing that we do first thing is oxygen. And sometimes like it's not able to be done at the home where wherever they are living, or even if they're in the nursing home where they're able to provide some oxygen, there is a certain time that comes where the person gets too short of breath, they come to the hospital. Now, once they're in the hospital, that's where I pick up. That's my job. From a pulmonary standpoint and our hospitalist and our infectious disease docs, that's where we pick up. And Dr. Polly, or our primary care docs, or our pediatricians, their job is outside of it. But once we come back inside, uh, into the hospital, that's where we take over. First things first is oxygen, whether it's two liters, a little bit of oxygen, a little bit more. And then once it gets worse enough, where you cannot give enough oxygen with uh, just a little bit of it, we have very different modalities to do it. And we do high flow of oxygen, a lot of oxygen going in and a lot of people do okay with it and they get better. Then we have something called BiPAPs and CPAPs. Once everything else fails, it goes to a ventilator. And every single person that I have in the hospital, when they walk in the door, like my conversation start that once everything fails, would you really like to be on a ventilator? We do 
everything and all to avoid it. But if that's the last resort, and if the person wants to do it, we do it. That's the first part. The second part is about the treatment. So we do have, we well, like I don't know where it will go in terms of the treatment in the future as we get more and more trials of things, but we have remdesivir, we have steroids, we have plasma for select patients. We have um, uh, what we call is like uh, preventing clots, which has been proposed. So we do all of those medications. And then we do medications that actually, if you do have a blood clot, that to, to actually treat it. So it's a multiple medications that we do, but the main thing is it's oxygen, how to deliver it. And once nothing works, it's the ventilator. And all throughout our, uh, from our colleagues, we have learned that when somebody goes on the ventilator, they just don't tend to do well. And unfortunately, that's what we are seeing over here as well. Um, what else can I say? What were some of the other questions that you have? Well, I have one other question for you. I, I smiled because your kitty cat's in the back, not because the oh, information sorry. you're sharing is funny. Um, but I, can you talk to us about how many days people are spending in the ICU? Long time. Once you go to the ICU, and we do like our nursing, like I'm so proud of our nursing staff and our respiratory therapist and everybody that's involved in the care of these patients because they are very sick and we avoid so hard to put them onto the ventilator. And once they go on it, that's hard. Average ICU stay, I don't know the numbers, but like I know that once person is in the ICU, they're kind of gonna be there for about 10 to 14 to 21 days and to come out of it to actually have a reasonable lifestyle or go back to how you were, it's very hard. And most people don't make it that way. Thank you for that. I'm going to transition us to John Miller, who's an ICU nurse, doing that hard work in the ICU every day, working with the patients you're describing. Um, John, could you tell us um, what it's like treating critical COVID patients and for you and your, your coworkers, um, what are you experiencing? But then also what are the patients themselves experiencing both physically and emotionally? Picking up on what Dr. Ashraf was talking as far as uh, sources of oxygen, um, the simple low, low doses of, of, of oxygen and progressing onto uh, the pressurized mass that then onto ventilation, there's usually what I see when they come in, um, or just as Dr. Ashraf was talking, just thinking of different patients that, that I and others in the unit have taken care of, they come in and obviously they're, they're sick enough that they need to come in, but their energy level still seems to be um, there. They can converse, they bring their iPads in, they, um, they have their cell phones, they're communicating with family. Of course, they can't have any visitors. So uh, the technology and media in that way is, is, is a real real plus for those people because they are, they are isolated away from family. Uh, but then I may, uh, I think of one patient in particular, I admitted them and that energy seemed to be there. But when I came back in and took care of them several, three or four days later, you just notice a progression. Uh, they become weaker uh, as they're getting sicker. They're not responding to the conventional uh, lower doses of oxygen. Uh, they need to be on um, a BiPAP and it reaches a point where um, a decision has to be made to go on, to go on the ventilator. Uh, we start seeing different signs that that happens. Some people just become so, and this is the, the people that perhaps are, are um, I don't want to say overachievers, but high achievers and, and independent and, and want to get through this and, and beyond. And so that you, you can see various people or different people respond differently to, to what's happening. But uh, just, just to watch them get to that point of weakness and some of them just, uh, I've had them just take off the mask. You hear the alarm and, and that's what you really have to cue into because the, every door has to be shut. Um, we have negative uh, air pressure rooms, and then we have filters called HEPA filters that helps filter that uh, air out into the system that eventually makes its way into the atmosphere. 
so you go in and, and basically the, the, sometimes they'll just say, I just can't, I can't take this anymore. So we rely on the physicians for orders, uh, some kind of sedation just to help, as I refer to it, taking the edge off uh, to an, an, and allow them to be able to continue on with this treatment, all the while knowing, and I work to uh, explain that to them, that the next step would have to be the ventilator. And before getting to the ventilator, there are those people who, who take the lead in, in, in um, leading us into what they would want to do or not do. I think in standard cases, uh, deference is given to the patient from what we sense from them, from, from what we gather uh, in our assessment findings, that they want to proceed and, and do everything. But you have those people, and, and one gentleman in particular um, that I had been taking care of, and he was reaching that. I, I just, I'm just getting really tired of this, uh, came in one morning to find out that he had said, you know, I, I talked to God last night, I've made my peace and I don't want to continue on. Uh, so that, even though that the, there are those cases and, and we look like that that's what's going to, to hear, hear the patient take the lead in that uh, requires some adjustment in your thinking and to realize, I mean, we can, I can see why um, they, they, um, they arrive at that point, but to then just help them in the next steps, whether it be able to go to hospice, which can be tricky in and of itself because of the capacity of what hospice is uh, able to take. We've had patients that uh, have gone comfort care and have to go to the COVID floor because that's going to be the best option for them. So um, that's for those patients. Uh, for others who decide to go on the ventilator, um, they, be, they, they are going to be sedated, and I try to talk to them about what that experience is going to be like. Uh, we have a very, very fine uh, health team members who are part of the anesthesia group. And we, we call them and they come and they will uh, intubate or put the breathing tube down. And then along with that requires um, uh, different types of monitoring. One is we put a, a, um, a cannula in the, in the radial artery generally and can monitor blood pressure instead of waiting for the blood pressure to cup to squeeze up. We can beat by beat determine what their, what their blood pressure is. Uh, then there's also another line that goes into the, the jugular vein, usually on the right side, and that can be used for giving medications and also monitoring uh, for how much, what their volume status is. So, uh, but then where the, the person is basically put to sleep for however time, long a period of time that needs to be. Uh, sometimes we use a, a paralytic agent that, that if the, the physician believes that they just need to be perfectly still so that in no way are they, they as I refer to, fighting against the ventilator, fighting against the very treatment that uh, we deem to be the most effective to help in their uh, chance of recovery, they need to be still. And so um, that's just basically presiding over it and those drips uh, can run out pretty quickly or frequently enough and we have to be aware of that to make those changes. But another modality that, that uh, we have been doing a lot of and this requires additional uh, people power is uh, um, a technique in which it's called proning. It has to do with the, the uh, um, when somebody's lying on their back and what happens when the lungs, as Dr. Ashraf has referred to, um, they're not ventilating in the way that they should, that research has shown that if you turn these people over on their stomach, that that helps recruit uh, the air sacs on the, on the backside or on the posterior uh, part of the lung, uh, which we need all the help we can get in that. So that is, that is a procedure that takes anywhere from five to six to seven people, plus a respiratory therapist managing uh, an immobile patient who in way, no way, shape or form can help. Uh, but it's a concerted effort. We uh, place a sheet over the top and we call it a burrito wrap where you uh, coordinate moving them up in the bed and then over to the side of the bed and then just completely flipping them over on their stomach. Again, there's, it's, it's total, total uh, work on our part to do that. Reposition them as such. One of the, the uh, side effects that can occur with that when somebody's laying on their face for such a long period of time, you run into other uh, incidents like uh, pressure areas that can develop whether on the nose or on the chin, the side of the face, uh, and all the while uh, having to have their, their face in a position that the ventilator tubing can work. You don't want to kink that off and cause a problem. So um, yeah, it's just um, the work, but I, I can't say enough about the teamwork of, of uh, for, for an ICU, my ICU coworkers. Um, we talked at the beginning as we were getting ready for this, this uh, panel 
about um, the importance of uh, one of the things that I expressed with Dr. Ashraf, the other physicians and other healthcare providers is the conversations that can happen and the way that we can support each other. Recognizing and in the 29 years that I've done this, I never, never would have imagined that I that this is something that I would sign up for, but um, here it is. And so what is my response and what can I do uh, to, to help and, and to be supportive of my coworkers and other healthcare providers as we all uh, row in the same direction or pull in the same direction to, uh, to uh, get through this time. I think one of the things that, that's, that I recognize as far as the emotional side of that and, and uh, you know, for staff, we work through and, and the numbers haven't been as good as, as, as being able to successfully get the people who have required the ventilator to be able to come off. Um, their condition is such that we, uh, that, that is decided uh, with physicians input and families making the final decision to go comfort care. But in the meantime, um, just backing up a bit for patients who are able to participate in visiting with family, uh, we're very fortunate in our ICU that it's on the ground floor so um, if patients, families can, can't come in, we have put signs, room numbers, uh, plaster or tape to the, the, the windows. And so families can come around the back, the employee parking lot side and find that room and come up and peer in the window and have their, their, um, their, their uh, phones, uh, iPads to be able to communicate with the patient. And my job in that is just to turn the bed so that that patient can have uh, eye contact with those family members uh, and to be able to, to make the most of a, uh, the situation. It's also been alluded to that a lot of times unless a family that uh, the, is decided for a, uh, the, the patient to be comfort care, um, they can't have any visitors. And I just, I try to think about what that must be like for the, certainly the, the patient as they lie there. And then for the family members who, who wonder, we do the best we can uh, with uh, phone calls that they call in and they have the code number. We can provide information. Physicians uh, call family members to uh, to provide updates, but it's still not the same as that physical presence, being able to, to lay eyes on on that loved one. And so, uh, um, and yeah, just as where we're at again, it's uh, I'm just appreciative of the work of of uh, Hutch Regional Medical Center and recognizing this and seeking to do what they can to help help us as we're all in this together. Everyone has a role to, to, to play and uh, we seek to, to, to do the best we can to move on through this time. Thank you, John. I think about you know what it would be like to not be able to be with loved ones at a time like that. And I, I can't imagine, but hearing you talk about your work and the way you do it gives me you know some peace to know that people do have you and others like you who care so much about them. So thank you for that. I'd also like to comment that you know, our, our Hutchinson Regional had the vision to invest in an ICU and this community supported that. And thank goodness, you know, and, and that we have that first floor where people can visit their loved ones, sometimes through glass, but, um, and for many other reasons, the ICU is, was a great investment for us. Dr. Lasso, I'd pivot to you and ask you if you could describe for us what it's like on the pediatric front and working with kids and families in our community. Thanks for having us do this, Aubrey, and, and everybody from Reno County and my colleagues here from the clinic and at the hospital. We're really thankful to have such a great team of folks that are working on this, and thanks for inviting me to, to join you tonight. Um, we are beginning to see increased numbers in the pediatric population. Um, initially, um, we really didn't have very many children that seemed to be impacted, and we're very thankful for that. Uh, we are beginning to see that number tick up um, in conjunction with the, with the adult numbers going up. Nationwide here in the United States, pediatric cases are accounting for about 11% of total infections. The American Academy of Pediatrics just released um, this week that in the single week ending on Friday, October 29th, there were uh, 61,000 cases in children alone uh, with over 850,000 children now in the United States having been impacted by COVID. So that's all comers um, from birth up to age 18. So whether it was mild or severe or hospitalized or not, that's, that's a lot of kids, you know. We're thankful that our 
pediatric cases only are, um, you know, a handful a day. Sometimes we might go a day and not have anybody test positive, but there are multiple active cases in, in the schools scattered across the, the county. But right now um, we're seeing kids with symptoms from allergy, just a little stuffy nose, runny nose, all the way up to severe fevers, red eyes, cough, low oxygen levels. Um, we're keeping an eye out for what has been in the news called the multi-system uh, inflammatory syndrome of COVID, Miss C, and that is a pretty severe inflammatory response that for some reason the COVID virus triggers what Dr. Ashraf was discussing earlier, this total body response. And for some reason, some people have a really hyperactive immune response. So their immune system just takes off and, and goes kind of crazy and becomes non-discriminatory in what it's attacking and ends up kind of attacking its, itself. So the body gets attacked and the antibodies cause um, inflammation in the eyes, the, the lungs, of course, the skin, the blood vessels, these kids are typically very, very irritable, crabby, fussy. They, they don't feel good, they hurt. Uh, they have high fevers. We've seen them up to 105 when the kids are having fevers. Um, they get swollen lips and cracked lips, a sore throat. It looks kind of like strep throat. They can get rashes all over their bodies. Uh, the cough, of course, difficulty breathing. They can get swollen hands and feet. We have to do a lot of um, a lot of lab work if we're concerned about that. And thankfully, we have not had any of those cases yet in Hutchinson, but we have had several children that have been examined for that. They've had one case at our local children's pediatric ICU at Wesley uh, that I've heard of of late. We have had to send several uh, patients to the ICU at Wesley. We have not really had any hospitalizations here for children that we've kept. So that's good, but it's also not good in that the children that have come in through the ER, they're either well enough to go home or they're so sick that they've had to go to intensive care. So the I don't know what the adult rates are as far as percentages of who ends up requiring intensive care, but approximately 30% of children admitted to a hospital for COVID do require intensive care. So that's pretty high. Um, and that, that was uh, not necessarily something that that I've seen a number on you know today but that was a, a recent number we're also concerned about our young athletes you know um, I have athletes in my family I have teenagers and um, we're thankful we got to have some sports seasons but young people who are getting COVID um, there are a percentage of them that seem to be getting heart muscle inflammation and that's called myocarditis there was a study um, released uh, from the East Coast earlier this fall that discussed college football players in particular who contracted COVID and up to 30% of them had heart muscle inflammation in that study. There have been uh, studies out of Europe as well showing uh, that multiple children um, that have that Miss C syndrome have heart muscle inflammation and it mimics another disease that we call uh, Kawasaki disease, which can cause blood vessel damage from the inflammation. So there certainly is a chance for children to have very severe disease. And we hope and pray that, that we don't experience that here, but our numbers are kind of ticking up. We do see children in our respiratory clinic uh, at Hutchinson Clinic in our Rapid Respiratory Response Center. Uh, we have a pediatrician that's staffing that every day. Um, Monday through Friday and pediatrician available on the weekends as well. So we're working alongside our family practice colleagues uh, to try to make sure that our kids always have somebody available for that. So that's kind of where we're at for kids right now. So I hope that answered what you needed. It did. Thank you very much for that. Um, we, we don't have a lot of time left. I do want to come back to Dr. Polly and Karen Hammer-Smith, but um, Dr. Ashraf, you were speaking to us before the call began talking about your rounds um, on a daily basis. I was really taken with what you were saying. And I wonder if you could, could you briefly share that, some of that with our audience tonight to get a feel for what you see every day? 
Absolutely. So, you know, like I answered the questions that uh, uh, medically we do everything that we can, but it's, there's only so much that medicine does. One thing is when you're in the ICU, our ICU has been full because of staffing issues, Dr. Degner, everybody has mentioned, and Amanda, our ICU is pretty full all the time. But it's also, it's not just about the ICU. It really has to do with what our floor is seeing. We have a COVID floor where all of these patients are stacked together, where now we're to a point, which we weren't a week ago or two weeks ago, where two patients are in each room. And now we got, as I round, like I have a lot of those patients on that floor. I put on my big papper uh, or my uh, respirator and I go into each of these rooms. As I walk in, I see a lot of these people are either 90 years old, 95, 85. It got into our nursing homes. It got into our at-risk population as described. And now they are just dying. They are suffering. And all I see is death all around. If you have ever seen a plague movie, like, you know, like we're older, one of the movies where it's a plague and the doctor is going in with their, all of their equipment and they call me the spaceman because that's what you look like. I go into that room from room to room and room, seeing multiple people and you see them struggle to take a breath in. You give them the best treatment, but nothing works. Nothing works. They, they, die and they suffer and that's where our staff comes in like you know john all our nurses our staff we make them comfortable when that time comes where we give them the best shot but it is heartbreaking to go from a room to room to room and see everybody struggling to take a breath on oxygen coughing it literally is about seeing a horror movie and it breaks my heart and I've shed some tears and I have gone about my day and we keep doing the best that we can. But as a community, I think we can do better. And that's not for me. Like once you're in the hospital, I'm the guy. But outside of it, it's you guys. It's everybody. It's the community. It's the doctors. It's the primary care. It's the pediatricians. It's the politicians. It's everybody has to do their part so they don't end up in this situation with myself seeing them suffer. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Dr. Polly, I ask you after hearing that and knowing that nobody wants to go through that themselves or have their loved one go through that. Um, where are the people in our community getting COVID? What are the risky behaviors we're engaging in? And what, what do we need to do next? So I know we're closing on the end here. I'll try to be quick, but where we're getting it has changed. Um, the prevalence in the community, what you could also think of as the concentration is so high. It's not that, it's not only that big gathering you're going to put on by, you know, somebody else. It's around your table at home. It's inviting your kids or somebody else from out of town to come visit. Um, it's that time with a friend where you think you can't get it because I know this person, we don't have high risk habits. Um, if you have any sort of allergy, cold symptoms, sniffle, um, based on what we're seeing currently, you have a 30% chance in Reno County for having COVID because that's what I'm seeing in the 150 people we see a day that present with those symptoms. Three months ago, it was one or 2%. As of this most recent Friday uh, and the week leading up to that, it's 30%. And those are our friends and family members, our fellow churchgoers, our colleagues. So if you have a symptom, 30% chance. And I forget the second part of that question because that, that whole thing gets me so worked up and, and worried and more motivated to do my part um, because I don't know if I have it. If you all see me in the store and I have a mask on, that's to protect you because I've been around it. But at least I know I've been around it. Everybody else thinks they haven't, but in reality, they have. I think you did answer those questions. And it's pretty sobering. I, as we head into a holiday season with Thanksgiving coming up and Christmas and other holidays around it, I, I wonder, Karen, what would you tell us from your health department perspective that we 
should or shouldn't do? Um, what, what behaviors, what should we change? And, and talk to us about the testing that's going on in our community. Um, what is the testing? What's it showing? And, um, and I hear a lot of people saying that we're, we have more cases because of testing. Can you speak to that a little bit before we finish here? Sure. Um, I'll just try to wrap up. Um, you know, the whole purpose of us um, getting here is really to get the word out. Um, the um, Everything that we did last March was to, to slow the curve. Um, and we didn't have anything to really slow back then, unfortunately. We're, or fortunately, we're in the Midwest, so it didn't come here yet. It, it started on the coast, and then it got here. And I think probably all of us um, looked at what was going on in New York and scratched our heads and thought, what are, what are they doing? You know, what's going on there? Um, as it has moved in um, September, we were like thinking, okay, we'll get things going with school. We're still looking pretty good. The positive test rate was creeping up there at about 7%. The first time we did it, we were in the yellow zone, um, which is caution, but we're like, our ICU is fine. You know, we, we've got this. Um, it took about six weeks um, and we were clearly in the red zone. Everything that DJ had been talking to us about with um, percentages and your positive test rate and this is what it's gonna look like. You know, we wanted to deny that too. We didn't want any of this to happen. Um, but unfortunately he was dead on. Um, the ICU is completely overwhelmed. And so that gets to everything that we have been preaching. Um, all the things that we want to do to mitigate this whole thing is, and we don't have much, we don't have an immunization, we don't have herd immunity, which are things that we have talked about all along. You can wear a mask. We get so much pushback about wearing a mask. It's pretty simple. Um, I don't, I don't like to breathe through a mask, but I can do that. And it's, it's not hard, but if it's saving anybody, that is so worth it to me. Just like Dr. Polly, he is around it all the time. He's going to wear that to protect anybody. Amanda is in the hospital with those nurses. John is taking care of these people. Dr. Ashraf is taking care of these people. And if you've ever been in the hospital and watched doctors come out of a room when you know how sick these patients are and they have put absolutely everything they can into it, you're going to put that mask on when you go out in Dillon's, if you're going out into Walmart, um, it's us as a community that needs to keep our schools open. It's us that needs to take responsibility for that. We have to wash our hands. We have to social distance. Um, community testing is, is finding any types of pockets that are out there. And so that was the whole purpose of doing community testing. Um, we don't have a higher positive test rate because we are testing. Um, what we have the higher positive test rate is because we have a higher number of cases. Um, I am not a statistician and I can tell you that I certainly don't know math very well and I guarantee DJ, who's our analyst would probably guarantee that as well. But if you take a group of um, 100 people and 30 of them are positive, we have a 30 percent positive test rate. So that's what we have right now. That is a lot of COVID. I don't think anybody probably in Reno County knows, doesn't know somebody that has had COVID. And that's where we're at. And we are all very passionate about what we can do to stop that. Um, once again, you know, wear the mask, social distance, and we're talking by more than six feet. If it's a family member, you're still going to have to, you know, spread out from them. Um, uh, all the things that we, we said, I, I just keep saying it over and over again. Um, I was asked about holidays as well. Thanksgiving's coming up. Christmas is coming up. This needs to look different this year. Um, I've already told my family we're, we're not getting together as a huge group. Um, you know, you need to keep it in less than groups of 10. That, that is truly what every medical person would tell you that's working on the front lines, because the more that you expose yourself, the more chance that you are gonna spread it. And when you get in a family setting, then you've got the very young and the very old, and they're very vulnerable. And those are the types of things that you just really need to think about. You need to be intentional about the things that you're gonna choose to do. Sounds to me like maybe we should postpone Thanksgiving till the spring, like they did fall sports. 
that might help. <laughs> Um, I appreciate that. And I know you've said it over and over, but I think that tonight what we're asking people to do is to join the COVID cutoff 10 day challenge. And Karen, I wondered if you would walk us through what those 10 things are that we're asking people in our community to do. Yes, thank you. Uh, we'd like you to wear a mask and social distance by six feet at all times, indoors or outdoors, um, plus maintain that at least six feet of distance outdoors. Avoid being indoors with non-household members except for, except for social um, work that can't be done from home or activities deemed absolutely essential. Work from home if possible and hold meetings online rather than in person. Hold gatherings online rather than in person and avoid situations that involve singing, refreshments, and other high-risk activities. Support local stores by wearing a mask, social distancing when in person, and if possible, ordering online or by phone with curbside delivery. Support our local restaurants by social distancing and wearing a mask or order to go. Continue to maintain healthy behaviors by keeping up with routine physician, dental, and eye appointments, and maintain a balanced diet and routine exercise. We want you to stay healthy. Mm -hmm. Those are really great points. I would say to our um, audience that if there are any questions you have that weren't answered here tonight to certainly reach out but you also might go to renogov.org to look at that dashboard that Karen described but also to see an FAQ of questions perhaps you have questions about quarantine I know that's covered there um, I'd like to thank all of our panelists tonight for sharing your insights and your experience and your hearts with all of us um, also as we head out remember the COVID cutoff 10-day challenge and know that our business community and our public entities have hopped on board with this and said they will take the COVID challenge and they're gonna plan some fun things for the rest of us to do. So beginning tomorrow, there's a make it or bake it feature with apron strings. Later, um, there's adventures and games with books at our public library. Um, there's a get outside event with Hutch Rec and the Cosmosphere. Pamper your pooch, ding dong ditch day where you can put, um, baked goods on someone's front porch from Holly's Sweet Treats, get crafty at the Wool Market, do it yourself mini golf with Hutch Putt, and a virtual happy hour with Metro Coffee and Sand Hills Brewing. Don't those sound like fun things that we could all do together while staying at home? They're virtual events, they're things that are safe, and you can find out more details about all of those um, at the Reno County Emergency Management Facebook page. Um, I wanna thank all of you for listening tonight, being a part of this, and together we can change the trends of COVID in our community. Thank you. Thank you.